Several people have asked me to share my thoughts regarding a series of tweets by a fellow game developer named Charles Randall, in which he argued that game devs would be much more open about development if the gamer culture wasn't so toxic. His tweets have been a source of the inspiration for some press articles, including both the Gamers Are Dead Y'all article, to which I already responded, and a Kotaku article called Game Designer Says Developers Would Be More Candid If Gamer Culture Wasn't So Toxic. So this is my response to Mr. Randall's tweets and the subsequent hubbub they've inspired. But first, a small bit of important context. I don't know Charles Randall. As far as I recall, we have never met at any game developers conferences or anywhere else, nor have we worked on any projects together. All I've really got to go on here is his tweets and the listing of titles at Moby Games that he's credited to have worked on. Now, even though I suspect that his list there is a bit incomplete, just like mine is, I feel it is important to acknowledge that our perspectives on the gaming industry have probably been colored by our respective experiences. He's worked on several titles that would probably be called core games, whereas my last dozen or so years of game development have been focused upon titles that are probably best termed family-friendly or kids' titles. To me, that means that it is uh, highly likely that we've been swimming in some different waters. I really haven't had to face too much harsh criticism from what might be called core gamers, and although it's pretty rare, sometimes when I've had an exchange with someone who might consider themselves a core gamer, and when they've learned that my most recent published products are four playsets in the Disney Infinity series, they'll be dismissive as those titles aren't real games in their eyes. Or even that my history of development is mostly composed of shovelware titles, and so that I'm not a real developer. I generally greet such feedback with a shrug, because I recognize that games like Disney Infinity weren't meant to appeal primarily to core gamers. They weren't the target market. And hence, such comments don't really bother me. Although, to be fair, if I'm feeling feisty, I might respond with, that's too bad, you haven't enjoyed the games I've worked on. What are some of the real games that you've published? I've yet to get a response to that little zinger. In any case, my point here is only that I'm not seeking to invalidate Charles Randall's tweets or to say that he's wrong in his opinion. If you've come here looking for a bit of drama between developers, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed. Rather, I just want to give a bit of a counterpoint to some of the things he had to say from my own experience as a longtime game developer and gamer myself. So, with that caveat out of the way, let's just jump right into it. The other day, a friend commented to me, I wish game developers were more candid about development. He was surprised when I said, we are. The caveat is that we're only candid with other industry people, because gamer culture is so toxic that being candid in public is dangerous. All right, so I have a few thoughts on this already. First, what does Charles or anyone else mean by gamer culture being toxic? And second, what's with this artificial division between gamer and game developer? Now, I'm not being deliberately obtuse here as I have some idea of the common connotations associated with these ideas, but I'd like to challenge them nevertheless. First, on the question of toxicity, I find that I don't really know what this means. It seems to be a very subjective judgment. In my own gaming experience, I've noticed that different games tend to have different cultures that form around them. The more competitive a game is, the more it seems to attract trash talking. For example, I've noticed that I've received recently little name calling or personal attacks in a game like Elite Dangerous, and considerably more in the post game chat for a game like dead by daylight. Personally, this sort of name calling really doesn't bother me, and in some cases I think some trash talking can actually be part of the fun. I'm hesitant to see the use of naughty words or personal epithets in a competitive gaming environment as something that is toxic, or something that must be suppressed or changed. Yes, I recognize that sometimes those words are sexist or racist or whatever, and I've probably been called names dozens or even hundreds of times myself in games like League of Legends or Team Fortress. And I always just laugh it off because it generally means that I'm getting under someone's skin via my play. In fact, that kind of name calling often seems like an invitation for me to reply with a bit of a smart ass reply of my own. You know, if someone calls me a uh, stupid faggot, I might reply with, ooh, are you propositioning me? Cause you sound kind of handsome there, big guy. And if I'm lucky, that'll get them even more upset, and they'll go on tilt, and they'll start playing like they've got a vendetta. 
It seems like it would be a shame to exclude that sort of psychological aspect from the truly competitive games. Getting someone to rage quit over a series of insults is just part of the fun. But I also think that it is crucial to note that if you're kind of thin-skinned and you don't want to hear or see this sort of thing, most games nowadays include options to block or mute players who are troubling you. Furthermore, you can kick the most egregious players or opt to only play with your friends. There are already a lot of tools available to deal with this alleged toxicity. So I really don't understand why some people need to make a big deal about it. If you don't like what somebody is saying, push a button and pow, they're silenced. Problem solved. I also disagree with the notion that game developers and gamers are different breeds or something. As I see it, everyone who plays games can be termed a gamer. There are just some of us who also happen to make games in addition to playing them. So I dislike this stratification of game developers are somehow a little better or have more informed opinions than do the regular gamer shtick. Yes, developers may know more about game development, but I don't think it is helpful to adopt a mentality of us versus them. I mean, I don't place myself as somehow being above other gamers because I've been fortunate enough to have made a career in development. In fact, I tend to see gamers as my primary audience who have allowed me that good fortune. This reminds me that if you ever have the pleasure of meeting Penn and Teller of the famous magic duo, you may note that Penn will uh, refer to you as boss should you talk to him for a bit. He's adopted what I think is the proper attitude. We are all in the entertainment business and our audience is our customer. Our primary duty then is to do what we can to keep them happy and our success really comes from how well we can continue to do that. All right, so on with the tweets. See that recent Twitter thread about game design tricks to make games better, filled with gamers angry about being lied to. Forums and comment sections are full of Dunning-Kruger specialists who are just waiting for any reason to descend on actual developers. See any thread where some dumbass comments how easy it would be to say, add multiplayer or change engines. Any dev who talks candidly about the difficulty of something like that just triggers a wave of people questioning their entire resume. Questioning here being an absurd euphemism for becoming a target of an entire faction of gamers for harassment or worse. There are still topics I can't touch because I was candid once and it resulted in dumb headlines, misunderstandings, and harassment. So while I talk candidly about certain big topics right now, I know doing so would lead to another wave of assholes throwing shit at me. And of course, I face almost nothing compared to women, people of color, LGTBQ plus folk. All right, so a quick note right here. What is the source for this narrative that allegedly regular Joes somehow receive fewer mean comments than do those from other minority groups? I've seen studies, such as the one done by Pew Research, that show that it's actually pretty equitable. For example, it appears that men actually receive a bit more mean comments throw their way than do women. But it also shows that women are more likely to take offense at those comments. So that's a bit of a different problem, right? Now, I might be wrong, but my sense is that the reason this narrative that mi minorities have it worse exists in the first place is because people imagine it exists. And, like Charles here, they want to virtue signal their sensitivity to the alleged problem but I don't think that the statistics support it. Again, I might be wrong, but I'd like to see some evidence in support of this narrative before overturning the findings of the Pew Research Center and thereby giving it too much credence. Anyway, but here's the rub. All the stuff you ever wanted to know about game development would be out there if not for the toxic gaming community. We love to talk about development, the challenges we face, the problems we solve, the shortcuts we take, but it's almost never worth it. I did a public talk a couple of weeks ago to a room full of all ages kids and afterwards a kid came up to me and was talking about stuff. And I shit you not, this kid, somewhere between 13 to 16 I'd guess, starts talking about how bad devs are because of a YouTuber he watches. He nailed all the points, bad engines, being greedy, you name it. I was appalled. I did my best to tell him that all those things people freak out about are normal and have justifications. I hope I got through a bit. But I expect he went back to consuming toxic culture via YouTube personalities. And one day, he'll probably harass a dev over nonsense. 
I touched on my feelings about this before. Yes, sometimes you'll get players who will criticize you for something they don't like in your game. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that people generally don't offer criticism about something if they don't care about it. My own opinion is that generally criticism about your game is a welcome thing. Even when it feels harsh or pointed or ignorant, it helps you as a developer to better understand the mindset of certain elements of your audience and what they are responding to in your game. Your audience generally doesn't lie about how they feel about things. Now, just because someone makes a criticism of your game doesn't mean that you have to necessarily respond to or address that criticism in the game. It may even turn out that the criticism is completely invalid because the person giving the criticism is far too uninformed about the business necessities of game development for it to have any merit. For example, when Anita Sarkeesian criticized Assassin's Creed Unity for not having female playable avatars, because she erroneously thought that all you had to do was change up a few animations and that should be a piece of cake. So the only reason she could see that they weren't included was due to misogyny on the part of the developers. Now, clearly, this sort of shallow criticism is too uninformed for anyone in development to take seriously. But I still think it's worthwhile for such criticisms to be made, if for no other reason than to be able to identify the level of development knowledge in your critic. Moving on. I worry about what other topical hatred he's picking up on at the same time. I guess this leads to a bigger point. When you attack developers for being political, that's a facet of the bullshit that forces us to keep things hidden from public view. The elements that contribute to harassing developers over perceived technical slights are the same elements as all the other hate out there. Next time you don't like a game, maybe consider just moving on? What is the value of helping spread hate and toxicity? This last point is where I say I most agree with Charles. I'm very much a free market advocate. If you feel let down by a game or a game franchise, the best thing to do is to vote your wallet. Either don't buy it, or if you feel you've been misled by the marketing hype, return it. I spoke more about this and, in particular, how I feel that No Man's Sky wound up in the place it did in my video on why do broken games get released? Finally, let me sum up by saying that I essentially disagree with what I take is Charles Randall's tone here that gamers are toxic and hence developers are withholding information from them. My opinion is that it is better for opinions to regard gamers as their customers and when they offer pointed criticisms, they're actually showing you that they care and are engaged. So as developers, we should strive for thicker skins so that we are less likely to take offense at those criticisms. Gamers aren't toxic. They're our audience. Let's listen to them. And also, let's remember that most of our players appreciate what we're doing for them. There's also a lot of good out there. For example, allow me to close this video with a fan letter the Disney Infinity team received. In light of the sad news concerning the ending of Disney Infinity, I wanted to make sure I was able to share what the game has meant for my youngest son and I, and hope that this message will be passed on to everyone involved in the game. Last year, my children and I were forced to move into a domestic violence homeless shelter. My youngest son was eight at the time, and I knew that the upheaval would be extremely challenging for him. When leaving, I made sure to pack his prized Disney Infinity collection, his game console, and a small monitor. He loved the game, and I thought although we were about to be homeless, by bringing the game I could offer him some moments of escape and perhaps even normalcy. I was not sure if he would be able to use the game at the shelter, but I knew it would be devastating for him if we left it behind. The first night being homeless in the shelter was extremely difficult. It was scary and filled with a lot of tears and uncertainty. As soon as we were offered a communal room, my son asked to play Infinity, which I gladly brought out from the car. Disney Infinity was such a positive outlet for him during some of our darkest days. The third evening at the shelter, he spent hours creating an elaborate house, and I could not help but cry when he told me, Don't worry, Mommy, I'm making us a home. Throughout our stay at the shelter, he made us many homes, and after each creation, he would sit there beaming with pride as he took me on a tour of each room and, for a brief magical moment, I would envision us having a place of our own. Although an eight-year-old is often limited in their ability to change the circumstances around them, my son, through Disney Infinity, 
was able to create for us a safe and beautiful world. I am pleased to say that my children and I now share a one-bedroom apartment. Although my son, who is now nine, no longer feels the need to create for us a home, he continues to create magnificent worlds for us to explore. His list for Santa this Christmas centered around the few figures and power discs he had yet to collect, and he was ecstatic when he unwrapped them. My reason for writing this is to offer my deepest gratitude to everyone that was, and is, a part of Disney Infinity from development, to creation, to marketing, to tech support, to sales. Please pass this message around to as many people involved in the game as possible because I want you all to know that what you all helped create was so much more than simply a game. You created a means for an eight-year-old boy to create magic and hope. And for this gift, I thank you. Game on, my friends.